What's going on, guys? In this episode of the sysadmin links, uh, we're going to cover a couple really interesting things. The first of them is health related. So after about five, six years of staring into a computer screen every day for work, I began having some eye issues uh, like ocular migraines and that sort of thing, which is really just a very painful headache accompanied with some blindness, blindness in the focal area. It's like terrifying the first time you get it, but it's actually not uh, you know, dangerous. But it really just comes from, allegedly, overstimulation of the ocular nerve. And the thing is, I was staring into a computer screen that was refreshing many times per second and beaming bright blue, mostly light, into my eyeballs. Bright blue is a nice bright color, it makes colors look really nice. So most computer screens are very far over into the blue uh, part of the light spectrum, which is like particularly crappy for your eyes. Redshift is a tool that you can use to undo the blueness of your color temperature and shift it over to the red side of the spectrum. Um, I think this will save some power too. So if you're on a laptop, uh, you've got the double benefit there. But it's the most easy thing in the world to use. You just do a package install. What you should do is just test it in a terminal. Open up a terminal and try a couple commands. So this is like day and night. I think it, uh, I think it automatically adjusts based on uh, the system clock. So you can have two different settings, you know, a brighter one for the day and a darker one for night. You can also set a gamma setting with the G flag, although I ended up not doing this. It just makes everything a bit dark. Try a couple commands. It'll fade to whatever setting you've given it. When you like that, you can either manually run that and then background it uh, using the ampersand character at the end of the command, or you can do what I did, which is I have the i3 uh, window manager. And what you can do is simply add a binding, a key binding for it. So when I hit mod shift I on my keyboard, it runs the redshift command with the options that I want. And I've, you can see I've actually commented out the gamma here, but in case I want it. So this is just in the i3 config. And I've also um, done a pkill, so killing any leftover redshift processes when I do a mod shift u. So that's pretty much it. Uh, follow along, save your eyes. Uh, I totally stopped having these uh, headaches or migraines uh, when I when I did this. so. It's not exactly a double-blind study, but it certainly has made using a screen pleasant again. I just wrote a really long post on programming. Uh, I think programming and automation are becoming more and more important for sysadmins and like ops people in general. Obviously, my YouTube channel caters not just to people that want to be sysadmins, but all this stuff that's being spun off of system administration and becoming its own discipline. So that is ops generalists, DevOps people, etc. A big part of your career is going to be infrastructure management and automation at scale. Programming is an amazing tool, um, which is going to be great for your career for that reason that I just mentioned, but it's also just incredibly useful anyway. Choosing a first language can be really hard, uh, or even just choosing a language to solve a specific problem to build a specific tool. I know that when I began programming, this is sort of when I began going outside of just like Linux and Bash, I spent weeks of time, literally b over the course of you know a month or two, browsing uh, different forums, and it's just like this this paralysis uh, of too many choices. It is so easy to get started these days, and people have very strong emotions about what the right thing is. I think that most people ask the wrong le uh, the wrong questions about the language that they're thinking about using, and that by asking the right questions, you can actually get a much better idea of what you should be looking at. Finally, I've got a couple of recommended learning tracks, sort of my ideal learning track that if I could do it all over again, I would do it in this order. Um, and then I have sort of a realistic learning track for those of you who like just need to get work quickly. And like once you're paying the bills, then we can worry about ideal order. Okay, Chocolatey, a package manager for Windows. I've been recommending this to my Windows sysadmin friends. It's basically, you know, once you use Linux and Unix, you realize that the way that they do package management has some incredible benefits, like 
a single command gets you all security updates that you that you need that have been packaged for you. Of course, you are relying on a third party uh, packager, which makes things maybe a little bit more complicated. But in general, this is a much better solution than you know trying to manage a fleet of a hundred machines or whatever with you know with GUI installers and like okay guys let's have our yearly meeting where we tell you to really just please click those accept buttons and don't install the browser bar but really really update flash every time it asks you it's a package manager for windows you should try it okay ipv6 is the future ipv4 is almost exhausted or actually is exhausted they used to have a count they do have a counter here and you can see <laughs> the assigned names association has given out all IPv4 addresses. They're still You can still get an IPv4 address when you rent a VM or uh, get some addresses when you rent a server. You can no longer request them, which means they've all been assigned and given out. Companies have them now. IPv6 is coming, has been coming for decades, <laughs> and it's becoming much more of a reality now. So there is much more of an IPv6 internet to speak of. And if you want to talk to the IPv6 internet, the machines that communicate using the IPv6 protocol, then you will need to be attached to the IPv6 internet. And if your ISP doesn't support IPv6, then a tunnel broker, which Hurricane Electric provides for free, uh, is the way to do it, which basically gives you a tunnel through IPv4 to get you connected to IPv6 with your IPv6 endpoint. Now, all modern versions of Windows and uh, Unix for a long time uh, are IPv6 capable. So you're really just tunneling through your shitty ISP um, at this point. And Hurricane Electric can help. These videos are the best and most gentle introduction to IPv6 that I've found. And the really important part is that HE has practical, like a practical track of like practical uh, little projects for you to do involving IPv6 and getting yourself connected and running a service on IPv6 that is, in my opinion, and backed up by research to be like fundamental to learning. So if you really wanna learn something, you gotta do project-based stuff and they will run you through their own little projects, which is enormously helpful. So watch these videos, sign up, do the projects and uh, get started with IPv6. Speaking of project-based learning, I wrote a long post on this. Uh, I've been thinking a lot more and reading a lot more about project-based learning and you know what actually makes knowledge stick and makes turns knowledge into usable skills for people. And it really is like projects are the shortcut. So if you simply focus on taking knowledge that you're acquiring and designing projects for yourself to do them, that will translate into usable skills very quickly without wasting all that huge amount of time and energy that you're probably wasting now by doing things like just taking notes and then hoping you remember stuff. I've created a course based on all that project-based hands-on theory. Um, if you haven't seen it yet, I assume most of you have just through the launch video. But if you haven't, uh, there's a course launch post with sort of a rundown of the, of the uh, content in the course. It's basically how to set up a WordPress hosting platform, not just a single site, but a hosting platform for beginners, probably aimed at slightly more to the beginner end of the spectrum than you are, but there's a lot of useful stuff in there, specifically some advanced stuff at the end. There's a whole unit on like performance optimization, uh, caching, how web performance actually works, security hardening, monitoring, actual like a real backup scheme, compiling software, etc. And yeah, that's it for my plug. Now to plug someone else's stuff. This is the game that stole, I don't know how many hours from me over my last vacation. Man, this is a fun game. It's a sort of city builder RTS strategy set in the Renaissance or late Middle Ages. It is awesome. So if you like economic simulations uh, that aren't just like a bunch of chart clicking, it's a lot of fun. SSH and Mike Lucas two powerhouses of system administration finally coming together uh, to make this video. So Mike Lucas, if you don't know him, is a great sysadmin and author. Uh, I love all of his stuff. Everything I've seen is great. And I always recommend his books. I've actually done a uh, review of a book of his on this channel before. But SSH is just one of those like basic sysadmin tools. It's it's like the Swiss Army knife uh, the transport protocol of choice for sysadmins. 
you end up doing everything with this. And if you really understand SSH and you understand what it can do and all the crazy amounts of features that it's got in there, if you really understand SSH, you can do some pretty amazing things that most people either can't do or can only do through great expense and time investment. And this video is a good introduction to some of the foundational like things you should be thinking about with SSH and things you can you can do with it. Mike Lucas is a great teacher. The way that he structured this presentation is great. So I just really recommend invest an hour, hour and a half and watch this and then try some of that stuff. I've also paused the video right here because uh, my favorite slide, because it says, <laughs> it calls FTP an appalling protocol. And I've had so many hours of anger at FTP over the last 10 years that that is just, it resonates so, so strongly with me. Um, yeah, FTP is horrible and uh, anything's better than FTP. There you go, watch this video. Mike Lucas is great, buy his books and uh, let him educate you on Unix and SSH. Speaking of videos, I just put a little uh, combined video post up on the blog. Most of you, I suspect, are beyond the very basics of command line work. But if you've got friends that ask you, which I assume you will have sooner or later, when they behold your sysadmin strength, you can send them here. This is just a little compilation of the basic command line stuff that I've done, um, both in the sysadmin beginners playlist and the bash playlist. It's also got a link over to the uh, Udemy course I was talking about before. Although the course is basically focused on a single project, which is setting up a WordPress hosting platform, it has just about an hour of uh, free video content that's that's all about Linux command line basics and more advanced things. So check that out. Finally, when you're starting to do projects, whether you're doing this, uh, this course on Udemy or not, you're going to need servers and cloud servers, uh, otherwise known as uh, virtual machines, or virtual private servers, or whatever they were called before they were cloud servers. I've got some recommendations here for places you can get them, uh, potentially get them for free, at least for a year. And the nice upside is that when you click through some of these links, uh, at least for the VMs, I will get some free, some credit and you'll get some credit which means you can get one or two months of free virtual machine use. And I just couldn't help myself. I, I have a physical machine section at the, at the end because it, I'm still one of those like people, obviously I work with, with Amazon AWS and I work with cloud stuff and I, I say cloud without so much as a, well, there's maybe a small hint of a smile at these at sort of a smirk at this point, but I've mostly suppressed all of those terrible emotions when people say cloud and I still can't help it. I write a post about, which cloud providers and VM providers I recommend. And at the end, I still have a section called physical machines because <laughs> sometimes it just makes so much sense to have a physical machine. You have guaranteed performance. The price is usually not much higher. Um, obviously, some companies will sell you, uh, you know, rent you physical machines at an unbelievably high price, but there's no reason to pay that. I've got a couple of really um, cheap providers here. You basically get guaranteed physical resources actual cores on a VM, you often don't know exactly what that corresponds to. Uh, physical machines just give you guaranteed performance. And with a little bit of failover, you can get extremely high uptime from them, extreme reliability, and the hardware is still managed. So it's not like you need to go and like swap out bad RAM or something. Um, that's still all done for you by data center personnel. So you can rent these all over the world for in many cases, an enormous price reduction, especially like some of these startups, you know, they're funded and whatever, they got to scale and blah, blah, blah. But buying physical servers or renting physical servers to support their peak load would be like 30 grand a year, less expensive or something. And you just shake your head and say, why, why are you doing this? It's not even less complex. Um, anyway, rent over. Don't discount physical machines. You can still rent them cheaply and they're extremely powerful. Um, if you have just like basic sysadmin skills and knowledge and you can do a little bit of failover and can configure a Unix box, you can get a lot of value out of it. Okay, that's it. Rant ended. Own tracks. For years, you've been tracked by advertising companies, governments, and criminals because you have a GPS tracker in your pocket, your phone. Well, this is an open source app, finally, that lets you be in control of your location data. So this thing basically just records your location data 
and they provide a free service that you can use to share it with people of your choosing, other people that have the application. You can self-host a server. It's all open source, so you can see that none of it's kept, that it's encrypted in transit, etc., and that it's not being like recorded anywhere. Although, obviously, someone could build a malicious public server. So if you don't trust anyone, you can run your own pub, uh, well, public or private server so that only you and your family and maybe your friends have access to your location data. It's a fun thing. I think you could build some interesting services like on top of this, too. Finally, Explain Shell. Uh, I think I posted this on Twitter and maybe even Facebook the other day. Um, it's just a, it's a fun little site, especially when you get very complex commands. This is sort of a little assistant. I'll give you an example here of, here's, here's a nice, uh, a really long command, right? We're like cutting with a delimiter of some space. We're taking the first field. Uh, this is the file that we're doing the cut on uh, for each line. We're getting the unique entries, so discarding duplicates, and then we're sorting that numerically. The nice thing about this is it doesn't do the thinking for you, right? Like, I, I just saw the example here. Um, this is, to anyone who's seen it, this is very obviously a, a, a fork bomb. Right? This is like something you do not want to type in to your shell because this is just gonna, it's a function that will create more functions that it backgrounds and uh, it just crash your machine in the end. It'll just fork and fork and fork and fork and fork and create more functions and fork and fork and fork. But at no point does this like give away what it is. Like it doesn't say this is a fork bomb, you shouldn't type it in. That's the, the thinking part that you need to do on your own. Um, it just describes the individual parts and what they are and what each option is and what a pipeline is and the background control operator. So this is a good, this is good for decoding things that seem really complicated without having to go through like 17 man pages. Um, so it saves you time, but it doesn't do your thinking for you. And that's why I think it's a great tool because tool that tools that try to think for you often their creators are not as smart as they thought they were, or they can't come up with every edge edge case. You often have problems with those tools, like information gets lost or like you think it's the wrong thing. You're told something that's absolutely incorrect. But with something like this, it's really just looking at the command and giving you man pages, the relevant section of each man page even for every single one. So I would keep this open, keep a bookmark or something, keep this open in a, in a tab somewhere for when you get a really long, really scary looking command, you can really just step through it and this thing will give you all the relevant documentation all in one place. So enjoy that. Uh, I hope those links are fun and useful. Remember to subscribe if you have not yet. Check out the main sysadmin basics playlist that I've created. If you haven't seen that yet, see you in the next one.